Good afternoon. Uh, sorry to the VA, you can't see how great we look here. But anyway, we're going to start with uh, acute mental status change as part of your emergency lecture series. I am not a neurologist. That's an upfront caveat. I'll even tell you neurology is probably one of my weaker subjects, but this is something that will occur over and over again on medicine service. So this is to give you an approach to the patient who presents with altered mental status, acute altered mental status. Okay, so what we're going to do today, we're going to go over some definitions and clinical features, some risk factors, a little bit about the epidemiology of acute altered mental status, pathogenesis, approach to the patient, management, and prevention. And as I mentioned to the audience here, I don't have the uh, slideshow that I wanted to present to you, so I'm going to try and remember as best as possible. So one place I want to start right now is with a case that I actually had several years ago, uh, kind of highlights how someone can present to the medicine service with altered mental status. I had an 82-year-old gentleman. He had come in from Phoenix on the bus because it was derby week, and he hadn't missed a derby in decades. So he had come in, and while he was still at the bus station here in town, he lost consciousness. So EMS arrived at the bus station, and uh, as part of their workup, they found that he was hypoglycemic. So he was brought on into the emergency department and subsequently admitted to my medicine team. He is a diabetic, uh, and he had taken his medications. However, he had not been eating normally because of the long bus ride. Well, while he was in this uh, hospital uh, as part of his early workup, we did the usual customary labs, and we found out he had an NSTEMI infarction, so non, just non-ST elevation MI. Because of that and his risk factors, we consulted cardiology, and he went to the cath lab. While in the cath lab, um, they had some difficulty. He had a very tortuous abdominal aorta while they're doing the procedure, and he lost consciousness again during the procedure, and um, we were told that they suspected that he had uh, an em embolism that had been knocked off during the procedure, so they thought he had a TIA. So he was transferred back to my medicine service, and he was on Lovenox and Coumadin uh, until he was therapeutic, and we discharged on him on that. He wanted to go to the track, so we arranged, got the, the Lovenox, and he took off, and lo and behold, he got confused again that day. He left his Lovenox in the cab, still went to the track, but he got out of it, lost consciousness again, came back to the emergency department. This time, my team sees him. We know him. He's totally unresponsive. We do sternal rubs and, you know, pinch and this and that and the other and totally non-responsive. Then all of a sudden, he wakes up, says, I have to pee, grabs the urinal, urinates, and then loses consciousness again. So... Our patient had three different types, we thought, of uh, acute altered mental status. His first one was hypoglycemia. You'll see that a lot. The second one, we thought, was a TIA. And his final one, which is one I, I've um, had um, on a number of patients in different varieties, he actually had atonic seizures. He was in status. And as we further evaluated, he had a focus from a previous CVA. So you can see on a medicine service, you can see a variety of causes of acute altered mental status. Okay. There are a variety of synonyms for this. Delirium is one we use commonly, acute confusional states, acute cognitive impairment, acute encephalopathy, and altered mental status. And again, obviously, we're talking about the acute, not the chronic variety. So how do we categorize our level of alertness when we're trying to tease out someone's consciousness? Well, obviously, if the patient is alert, they are awake and aware of their surroundings, and they are able to respond to those surroundings, preferably external uh, stimuli. A little bit lower level of alertness is the lethargic individual. They can be aroused by, you know, not really vigorous, but moderate stimulation, and if you quit stimulating them, they drift back to sleep. The obtundant individual is more depressed. It's a deeper uh, uh, degree of depression. And they won't completely arouse, even though you can get them to awaken their eyes and, and maybe talk, mumble a little bit, but they really are not surfacing to a full level of alertness. 
the next deep level is stupor, also a semi-conscious, a semi-comatose level. And these individuals require vigorous and repeated stimulation to arouse them, but they don't truly awake and respond, and they will immediately lapse back into that unresponsive state without vigorous stimulation. And finally, the deepest level is coma, where they are unarousable and unresponsive. So what are some of the clinical features of delirium? Well, first of all, uh, the hallmark of it is the lack of attention, uh, a deficit of attention, if you will. It is a bedside diagnosis, uh, and I stress this, if a nurse calls and says the patient uh, has a change in their mental status, you can't just say, give them some Valium, give them some whatever. You need to actually go to the bedside and see why they have an acute altered uh, mental status. There are two broad types of uh, delirium. The hyperactive type is the type we typically will see with someone who's going through acute uh, DTs, you know, agitated, restless, um, hallucinating, what have you. And then there are the hypoactive type of delirium, such as your drug overdose patients or a, a, a hypoglycemic individual. They're, they can also be agitated, but those are the two kinds of varieties. Historically, when we have talked about delirium, we have emphasized the importance that it is a completely reversible process, that the mental status returns fully to the norm. I think it's important to be aware, however, that we really don't have any long-term studies on that, and it probably depends on the patient's underlying brain function, which we will talk about in a little bit. Okay. so. The level of consciousness, first of all, you have to be able to be alert to be conscious, right? And the part of the brain that is involved with that is the brain stem uh, ascending reticular activating system. It alerts the cortex. If the cortex is not made to be alert, it cannot respond to any external or internal stimuli. So in the complete disruption of this, you have a comatose patient. Now, you must have alertness to be attentive, but the reverse is not true. You know, the, the vegetative state individual can be alert, they can be awake, but they are not attentive to their surrounding. That requires a cortical function. So, with our delirium, what are our diagnostic criteria? Well, you must have the altered level of consciousness that we talked about already, so from the alert to lethargic, to obtunded, to sem the semi-comatose and comatose, they're getting a little bit past the, the uh, delirium stage, but uh, um, loss of consciousness uh, completely is a different realm. The inability to attend to specific stimuli or to shift their attention appropriately. Also, when you can determine what their baseline mental function is, their cognitive capabilities, such as memory and orientation, they have a reduced ability uh, compared to their baseline with respect to that. They can have perceptual disturbances, such as hallucinations, auditory or visual. Uh, however, it has to be not due to an underlying psychiatric diagnosis. And disorganized thinking is also common. Okay. What distinguishes delirium from dementia is the acuteness of the change in the mental status as well as the fluctuating course. You know, you've heard of sundowning. That's a very common time where there's altered mental status, uh, but they regain um, normal function. That happens classically with folks who have underlying dementia, and then you put them in a strange environment, and that can set them off. But the key is it fluctuates. They can arouse and appear to be normalizing, and then they get uh, depressed uh, cognitive status again. Probably the biggest risk factor uh, for developing acute altered mental status is the older age of the patient as well as whatever their baseline cognitive functioning or dysfunctioning is. And it actually develops in as many as 50% of older folks who have an underlying cognitive abnormality when they're hospitalized. And more than two-thirds of the case of delirium occur in folks who have underlying dementia. So when I talk about, you know, they used to emphasize the importance of reversibility, 
that's true within uh, certain limits, the underlying cognitive dysfunction will not improve. Other factors that predispose an individual uh, to developing delirium is sensory deprivation. How often does somebody come into the hospital, uh, they don't have their hearing aid, they don't have their glasses, so they cannot perceive things normally, so that increases their risk. We tie them down, you know, they're immobile from either um, a fracture, you know, hip fracture, they classically can get uh, delirium. They may have underlying malnutrition or other illnesses that make it more likely that they develop delirium. We do things to patients that increase their likelihood of developing an acute altered mental status. Bladder catheterization, uh, that not only ties them down, it increases their risk for urinary tract infections, which we know can cause uh, acute delirium. Physical restraints will do that. Sleep deprivation is very common in the hospital. You know how noisy it is out in the hallways, and, and someone comes in and wakes them up every two hours, and uh, that disturbs the underlying uh, brain function. And very important, addition of medications, and three or more medications is uh, a definite increase. Certain surgical procedures have higher risk than others. Cardiopulmonary bypass is one that is particularly high. Some of those folks may actually have uh, em emboli during the procedure and uh, could have some underlying undiagnosed new uh, cerebral infarction. infarction. Okay and either inadequate or excessive treatment of pain uh, is a risk. Okay. Why is this important for you all to know about acute altered mental status? Well, there's a variety of reasons, but uh, we don't recognize, I think, how bad of a prognostic factor acute delirium is. Uh, it increases the risk of complications during the hospitalization. It increases the risk that the individual is going to end up institutionalized in a nursing home. And actually, it increases the risk of death. They have uh, as high a, a rate of death from a diagnosis of delirium in the hospital as if they had been septic. So that about 30 to 40 percent, uh, well, not 30, 40, 20 to 30 percent chance of mortality with that. And I've already gone over the, the risk factors, including their advanced age and underlying dementia. Medications are implicated in 30 to 40 percent of the cases. People who've who've rounded with me always know if you can't explain something, run the drug list, and it frequently will be the culprit of whatever is going on that you can't explain. Okay. It is a frequent occurrence. If you take all comers presenting to the emergency department, 2% of them will have a, a chief complaint of altered mental status, acute altered mental status. However, if you take folks who are 70 years of age and older who present to the emergency department, more than 40% of them will have an altered mental status as part of their presentation. It occurs in 10% of all hospitalized patients, but again, if you've got the elderly patient on your service, it happens in more than 50% of those individuals. If they're elderly and in the ICU, it goes up to 70%. Very, very prevalent. Okay, it happens also in the nursing home frequently. Uh, here, here's where I was talking about the in-hospital mortality, 25 to 33 percent reported. It increases the length of stay and also, as we said, their likelihood of going to the nursing home. Okay. Okay, so pathophysiology, not my forte here, but we'll do it briefly. Uh, primary brain injury or disease is not the common uh, presenting factor uh, for this, but it can be. Secondary brain injuries, otherwise known as encephalopathies, are frequent causes, and it is felt to be related to deficiencies of acetylcholine um, in the brain and the, the neurotransmitters, and there are a number of anticholinergic medications that uh, precipitate that, so that's a class of medications to be aware of. Increases in dopamine also are uh, felt in some studies to be contributing as risk factors. So what do you do? You've got your patient that is presenting in the ER, in the hospital, in the ICU, you need to know how to first approach the patient. Especially if you're starting out in the emergency department, you need to establish quickly things that are eminently risky and then what things need immediate intervention, then go back and take additional history and additional physical exam uh, as time permits and as the patient's status warrants. So first, you need to establish, as always, ABCs. Stable vital signs. Often you want to administer urgent 
therapy for potentially reversible um, causes. Common examples, thiamine. My patient who's hypoglycemic, you give them glucose. If you think they're a narcotic overdose, you'll give them naloxone. If they're a benzodiazepam overdose, you think, you'll give them flum flumazenil, kind of as a diagnostic test. Remember, it won't be treatment. It's just to see what's going on. Those folks who cannot protect their airway or are hypoventilating will need to be intubated. If there's any chance that they have sustained trauma to their cervical spine, part of the, the early protocol is that their cervical spine needs to be stabilized until we have established that. Then you'll get additional history and we'll do that's related to what you think is going on and, and primary survey and neuro exam. Okay, so some of the things that you need to be thinking about early. Do they have any reason that they would have elevated intracranial pressure? You know, you suspect a bleed or a tumor. Um, you'll go down that pathway. Do they have signs or symptoms that make you think that they have a CNS infection? Obviously, if you think that, they need urgent antibiotics and lumbar puncture once it's safe to do so. Myocardial infarction can present. Hypertensive encephalopathy, uh, status epilepticus, acute ischemic stroke, subarachnoid hemorrhage, organ failure, liver, kidney, heart failure, pulmonary failure, and one of our favorite, most common that we get admitted all the time are toxic ingestions as well as withdrawal. If we weren't if we didn't have alcohol withdrawal, I think we would have a third as many patients uh, admitted. But anyway, so those are things that you need to think about early and that will then uh, direct your next diagnostic tests and next therapies. When you're starting out with that folk, the individual who have altered mental status acute, acutely, you think it's acutely, you need to do some focused examination looking for signs of trauma, needle marks, that would give you a hint uh, whether that, you know, maybe perhaps it's a heroin overdose. Do they have any stigmata such as liver signs or signs of infective or embolic phenomena? You want to assess their pupillary size and reactivity. You want to check their baseline eye position and whether there's any deviation or nystagmus. When appropriate, you'll test for their oculocephalic reflex after you make sure that their neck is stable. Altered mental status patients, we should be performing a Glasgow coma scale on them so that we have a baseline and we can monitor whether it is improving or uh, deteriorating. In certain instances, you're going to want to look specifically at the respiratory pattern. Do they have apnea, chain stokes, respirations, and they give you clues to what's going on. You'll look at their resting posture, and do they have any spontaneous motor activity. Okay, this is just a... To give you some ideas, you know, A, this column is theoretically the normal column. So here you have one dilated, unreactive pupil, and you're going to think about an uncle herniation. This uh, here is a pinpoint or meiotic pupil. Uh, could be a Horner syndrome. If you have bilateral mid uh, point non-reactive pupils, then you've got a mid-brain disruption that you can think about. Net can be from anoxia, hypothermia, uh, anticholinergics, barbiturate overdoses, to dilated fixed pupils, anoxia, hypothermia, severe barbiturate overdose again, and to pinpoint reactive pupils, you think about opiates or damage in the pons. Okay. So just a quick review for you of your Glasgow coma scales. Normal people should open their eyes to verbal comments, they should be fully oriented, they should be able to follow commands, so they would get a maximum score of 15. And the comatose individual will keep their eyes closed to verbal stimuli. Uh, they will do nothing on verbal stimuli. They will move nothing, so their minimum level is 3. So you can see the increasing degree of response needed, verbal stimuli noxious, um, and then their degree of orientation whether they follow command, localize pain, withdraw, etc. So here's a decorticate posture, which is a midbrain finding. Here's decerebrate, which is the pons, and a flaccid, no motor movement at all is consistent with uh, the lower pons and lower, including the spinal cord. So if you have an individual who's very stupor or comatose, you want to focus your neurological examination on observing their breathing pattern, 
the pupil size and reactivity, as we just mentioned. Uh, you want to look at a fundoscopic exam. If you can, you're looking for papilledema and other findings there. Corneal reflexes, their doll's eyes, gag reflex. We've already talked about the motor response with our Glasgow Coma Scale. Do they have any abnormal movements? Do they have monoclonic jerks? Do they have asterixis? You want to check for uh, reflexes, including deep tendon reflexes, as well as pathologic reflexes, such as the Babinski. My key point here with the vestibular ocular reflexes is, first and foremost, don't test them if they have cervical spine problems. Uh, an abnormal response such to cold caloric suggests a brain stem finding. We're usually going to have neurology on board with this, but so there are a few things that I wanted to mention. Severe metabolic comas, such as barbiturates, can give you findings consistent with brain-dead pupils, but they're not brain-dead till time has allowed those toxins to uh, be cleared from their systems and hypothermia corrected, those type of things. So what are some of the early things that you do? Obviously, you need a comprehensive metabolic panel. You get your electrolytes, including your calcium, magnesium, and phosphorus. You get your CBC because that's going to give you some hints if they're infected. Are they thrombocytopenic? Could they have had a head bleed? You don't do this on everybody, but you, you get a good sense. Do they have something that's concerning for infection? Do you do blood cultures, urine cultures, chest x-rays, um, that sort of stuff? If you have high enough suspicion of meningitis, you quickly get that um, to where the patient can undergo an LP. Myocardial infarctions can cause acute altered mental status. So you'll, under the right setting, you'll be getting an EKG, blood gases, carbon monoxide poisoning. We have several of those every year, especially if people are using their uh, generators or they're using some alternative heat uh, in their house. Toxicology screen, lots and lots of that. Most of our folks will have had brain imaging for us before they get to us. Uh, and there's a time and place for that. But acute altered mental status, they often do need this. We talked about that. If you think they might be having a seizure, you can get frequently, even in our ER, a STAT EEG. I don't know about overnight, but during the daytime, you can actually get one done right away in the ER. Okay. The differential diagnosis for acute altered mental status is humongous. Uh, so I'm going to break it down into two main categories. One is a primary brain process, and the other is secondary, which is also go, goes by the name of encephalopathy. Trauma, whether it's a concussion, a contusion, can present, usually not to us, but sometimes they will have had an incident and they're stable and they go to the medicine service and then they have their altered mental status a few hours later. They can have lacerations of uh, intracerebral uh, blood vessels, subdural or epidermal hematomas. They can have vascular disease. They can have a hypertensive bleed, ruptured aneurysms, causing an intraparenchymal hematoma. Uh, they can have an arteriovenous malformation that has bled, a bleeding disorder, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhages from ruptured, ruptured aneurysms, AVMs, or secondary to trauma. They can have an infarction, uh, thrombosis, embolism, vasculitis. And for Dr. Griffin, uh, malaria also can be a cause of uh, infarction from a vasculitic process. Infections, we've hit on these, meningitis, encephalitis, intracerebral abscesses, neoplasms. We have primary CNS malignancies. We have metastatic malignancies. We also have non-metastatic complications um, such as progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy that can present with acute altered mental status. Seizures are actually uh, something that I think we have um, less experience with. Partial complex and atonic seizures are frequently missed in my experience. We had a patient uh, a couple months ago who had been in the intensive care unit several times and she'd been found to have, uh, she developed acute respiratory failure. And um, I think Dr. Knight had her go to the unit on one of those occasions and, and he said something, he, you didn't write it, but you said something that I think she had a seizure. Well, it turns out 
she was back on my service the first time I'd seen her, and she was doing really strange things. And she would answer questions very bizarrely, and she'd hold her arm up like just holding it up, and you'd try to get her to move it, and it would just move a little bit. And she would have a little bit of strange lip motions, you know, but she could still converse with you, just not appropriately. I said, I think she's having seizures. We've got a stat EEG. Yeah, Neil was with us on that. And the resident actually read the EEG, and he said it was consistent with seizures. And before the attending who read it said no, Neil gave the patient Valium, no, the raised Pam, and lo and behold, the altered mental status corrected. So this is something that can present in all kinds of weird different ways, but it, it is not that uh, infrequent, so keep that in mind. Toxicities, everybody gets heavy metal toxicities if we can't explain things, but it's very uncommon. Carbon monoxide we've already talked about, drugs we've talked about, alcohols of all different kinds. Hypoxic encephalopathy. These can be due to organ failure such as severe heart failure. It can occur with COPD decompensation. You can also get CO2 narcosis as a cause when we are aggressively treating their hypoxemia. And hypertensive encephalopathy actually is a hypoxic encephalopathy. Metabolic, you name it, it'll happen. Any system, the endocrine system, hypoglycemia, so low blood sugars, the varieties of hyperglycemia, be it DKA or a hyperglycemic non-ketotic hyperosmolar state, renal failure, electrolytes, hyponatremia, hypercalcemia, hypocalcemia, uh, myxedema coma can be fun and interesting. We have lots of experience with hepatic encephalopathy. I had a uh, YouTube version showing you all the liver flap. I think one of the things that's helpful for you to distinguish, you can't always tell, is it a tremor or is it asterixis? One of our neurology folks taught me in the past, tremor is actually a contraction. So, you know, you think about the motion as a jerking because the muscle has contracted. In contrast, Asterixis is actually a loss of motor turns. So and when you hold, tell them to hold their hands up in the stop sign, it's when the flat part, the dropping part, the loss of the motor tone is, is what asterixis is. So that kind of distinguishes it. And the, the case I had where the neurology folk taught me, we had a young woman with renal failure who was on high dose uh, neurontin. And lo and behold, that can cause encephalopathy and can cause asterixis. And I had consulted them for this new, quote, tremor that I saw of her arm, but it, in fact, was asterixis. So I learned something. Okay. There are physical causes. Uh, heat stroke uh, can be one. And this recent summer has been a big time for that. Hypothermia in the wintertime. Deficiency states. Uh, thiamine you need to think about uh, with our Wernicke's uh, encephalopathy folks, uh, we think of with alcoholic uh, folks all the time. The stagmas, their extraocular movements are limited. They have ataxia if we get them up and they're confused. So we start out with patients presenting with altered mental status to the ER usually. Like we said, assess their ABCs, you immobilize the cervical spine if they have any history of trauma. Uh, you want to secure their airway if it's necessary. We talked about this. Uh, if you suspect Wernicke's, give them thiamine before they get glucose. Yes, so we want to give them their thiamine before they get their glucose because if the other direction, it can worsen their symptoms. Uh, other empiric treatment, if we think opioids, as we said before, you give them naloxone. You do the whole big workup. Uh, depending on what you have found, including the full electrolytes, urine, looking for urinary tract infection, chest x-rays for digestive heart failure, pneumonia, anything else there, blood cultures. And when you get your basics initial started, then you'll go back and do more extensive history. These folks do get a CAT scan. Um, if it is negative, then you need to think about infectious causes. You need to think about the electrolyte and metabolic problems. Lastly, because it is a diagnosis of exclusion, you want to evaluate for psychiatric conditions. If you the CT is negative, but you still think they have had a subarachnoid hemorrhage, they still require a lumbar puncture uh, because you can miss a subarachnoid hemorrhage, and then it 
can acutely worsen. Right? If they have abnormal CT, they usually get to have neurology and or neurosurgery in, involved. Uh, looking for strokes, they may be thrombolytic candidates. And if they have increased intracranial pressure, hemorrhage, what have you, they may need uh, drainage, seizure prophylaxis. You guys will spend a fair amount of time in the ICU. Hopefully you're seeing something comparable uh, to this approach, which is routine screening for the ICU patients. And that is done with uh, an agitation sedation scale, such as the Rich Richmond score or the RAS, and then the CAM for confusion assessment method. Normal is an alert, calm patient. The agitated patient goes from restless upwards to combative with a high score of four. They can become sedated with drowsy down to deep and unarousable response. And the drowsy and light sedation and moderate is they assess that by their eye contact to verbal stimulation and physical stimulation is required to assess for the deep and unarousable uh, RAS scoring. So if you have a RAS score of negative 4 or negative 5, there is no point in looking for delirium because they are unresponsive, so you stop there. But any individual in the intensive care unit who is a negative 3 through positive 4, and, uh, then you would go ahead to the delirium assessment method. Okay. Um, so if they have an acute onset of changes, then you want to test their attention span, and one of the ways the nurses can do this is you tell the patient to squeeze your hand on the letter A, and then you can see here, it's save a heart, S-A-V-E-A-H-A-A-R-T, so they get a point for doing it correctly for every A they squeeze, they miss a point for squeezing on the wrong letters. If uh, there's, their score is zero, then they, uh, you stop because uh, if the RAS is other than zero, the patient is, in fact, delirious. Okay? If the score is zero, they still could be delirious. You look for disorganized thinking. You ask questions like, will a stone float on water? Will a leaf float on water? Are there fish in the sea? Are there elephants in the sea? You know, things like that. And those determine if they have fewer than two errors, they're not delirious. Because remember, we said it's a very common problem in the intensive care unit. This is something that they can do for uh, visual screening assessment. The nurses ask uh, the ability to uh, the patients to concentrate, and they have different flashcards that have pictures on them, and they show them five. Say, here's a picture. You know, they tell them what it is, and then they show them ten pictures five of which will be the ones they have seen before, and they're supposed to respond yes or no, have they seen them? So Mrs. Jones, here's this picture, watch carefully and try to remember each picture because I will ask you which pictures you've seen, and then you'll show them pictures like this, and then and name them, and then reassess with them shuffled in with the others. Okay. Then they get three seconds for each one, and you give them credit. So that helps tell about their attention. There are a lot of things that we need to do to prevent altered mental status. One is identify the high-risk patients. We've already talked about those in the intensive care unit, those that are elderly, those that are demented. Um, and we want to try to prevent anything such as visual and hearing impairment that will make it more likely, tying the patient down, sleep deprivation, dehydration, avoiding polypharmacy. Those are all important. This is a, a mnemonic that I kind of use for a variety of things, but it might help you. Uh, vitamin C, you can come up with differentials for all kinds of things. But have they had a vascular event? Eyes, there's lots of eyes, infectious, inflammatory. T, is it a traumatic process? Uh, is it thiamine deficiency? Is it temperature, hypo or hypo, hyperthermia? A for abstinence, are they having some type of withdrawal picture from benzos or alcohol? Anomalies, maybe they have an AVM or something. Metabolic, we see lots and lots of metabolic causes and medicine causes on our service, as well as ingestions. I've lumped idiopathic here, uh, the psychiatric under that, because we have to rule out our, med our medical causes before we label it as a psychiatric problem. 
neoplastic, whether it's primary or metastatic or perineoplastic. And I couldn't figure out how to put this in here, so C is for seizures uh, or connective tissue diseases like vasculitis. Uh, so that's what I have on this 